Understanding nature is vital to life and to art. When we slow down to engage with the natural world, our creativity and imaginations ignite. This spring, we're exploring the theme Blooming Colour, delving into the ways nature and colour can be a catalyst for artists to soak up the full spectrum of beauty and diversity in the world around us. Today's guest, Sandy Terry, is an award-winning painter whose passion for florals bursts off the canvas. With loosely flowing brushwork and richly layered pigment to achieve greater depth, her work is truly breathtaking. In this episode, we're excited to be catching up with her to discuss her craft, personal journey, and devotion to her subject. My name's Sandy Terry, and um, uh, at this point, I guess I'm known as a floral artist. When I was about 19, I went to see a George O'Keefe show to see these incredible paintings that she had created. They were feminine, but they were strong, and they were, you know, form and color and sensual and like for a young woman, that was incredible. And they stayed with me. I was a teacher in the schools for 32 years. And when I retired, um, I had this idea that what I was going to be doing is I was going to be making uh, reproductions of George O'Keefe's work. This was my big game plan. And then I went to a gallery and told them what I was going to be doing. And, uh, and they said, well, why would you want to do that in the first place? And I was like, oh. And then somebody else took a look at them and they said, you know, they're pretty good. So why don't you do your own? And it felt like I was taking a leap off of a cliff. I just started painting and probably about my third or fourth painting already I was showing and I'm incredibly grateful. It's kind of given me a whole other life. You know, it's given me purpose when I wake up in the morning and uh, it's a way to connect with people. Well, it's not just the beauty of the form of the flowers, but there's a delicacy about them. And yet there's a tenaciousness about them where, you know, they, they come back year after year. And uh, so there's kind of an inner strength about them. Flowers are also a metaphor for me often because um, we use flowers to commemorate things like, you know, weddings and the birth of children and, um, you know, any anything associated with a loving relationship is often associated with flowers. When my eldest daughter was moving to Toronto, I created a piece called Caress that the two of us actually worked on the composition for that piece. We did that together. And so when I was sending her off to Toronto, I actually sent her a print, a large print of the piece because for me, caress was about tenderness in our family. So it's where it's where the name of the piece was kind of a metaphor for what was happening in my life and my feelings toward, you know, toward her and to send her off in love. I always have been drawn to color, but uh, when I was working with children, I, it was actually working with them that I learned a lot more about color. And I was using Opus uh, Chromatemp paints because uh, the primary colors mix really true. Most of the school paints that they give kids, if you mix the red and, and the purple together, you get uh, red and blue together, you get brown because they don't mix true. But uh, the Chromatemp paints, I could actually, they, kids could mix colors. So they only had the primary colors in white and black. And I could get the kids, unless they're colorblind, I, I could get the kids to mix every color by the end of the two months of painting that we did. So, but, but by working with kids to teach them how to mix color, it refined for me also how to mix color because I, I could draw before, but color was not, it was not the thing that I felt like I had expertise with. I think the big thing I had to learn was um, for me was how to put value into paints. What I mean by that is the lightness or the darkness of the of the color. I knew about that in drawing, but I had never kind of made the the shift to um, doing that with paint and color. It's also why I started experimenting more with opaques and transparent uh, paints because I love 
the light that I can create when I'm using transparents, but I also need to use some of the opaques to get the darker colors underneath brushes are also essential. Um, for me, I had to learn um, what different brush shapes would give me the effects that I wanted to achieve. And there's a whole range of different brush types. So I had to let myself play. And we let the children do that. But as adults, we don't often let ourselves do that. But I found I had to play with lots of, you know, different um, brushes and and to see what kind of um, effects and textures I could create with the different brushes that I had. I've had a lot of playfulness with mediums also. I felt like a kid let loose in a candy store when I first retired from teaching and I could just explore and I went kind of crazy. I was trying everything. Um, so, uh, and, and I'm so glad I did because I was also working with gold leaf. I was, um, uh, yeah, working with iridescent paints. I mean, I, I've done all of that and that was really fun. But then there was a point where I found my voice about what it is that I, uh, kind of what I want to do and where I wanted to go. And I'm at that place now, but I think that that exploring phase is really, really important. And I would say for anyone who's starting out that you kind of have to do that. You, you have to do that to find who you are and, and, um, and where you're going to be going in the journey. If you are painting um, more from, you know, your heart and you're trying to capture the spirit of the flower, you, you can kind of do whatever you're wanting to do. But if you're painting representational flowers, it's not very forgiving. <laughs> You, you have to kind of nail the, the accuracy of the drawing because it, it will read like it's not accurate. So I think that that's one of the first decisions that a person needs to make is what type of flower, that if they're really drawn to flowers, what kind of flower that they would want to, how they would want to interpret that. What else do I say about flowers for somebody starting? Be brave <laughs> and dive on in, you know, um, have fun, be playful. Um, cause in that process of, of diving in and, and, um, and trying and, uh, you're going to make mistakes and don't worry about that. Um, just keep on going, you know, just keep moving forward because in the process of moving forward, you are going to be going on your own journey and, and, um, creating something that, uh, is uniquely, you. That was the cool part about being older. It was like, I don't really care what anybody thinks anymore. I'm just going to do what I want to do. And, and, and I'm so, I, I'm so thrilled. It's led me to this place because it wasn't what I was trying to do or seeking. I was really just trying to do something for myself after years of giving to others. At this point, there are specific flowers that I am drawn to. I, I tend to paint a lot of roses and I tend to paint a lot of peonies. Uh, also magnolias. They have a lot of meaning for me. I had a magnolia tree outside my bedroom window when I was a child. So I loved watching that tree, you know, bloom and transform. And then I love the foliage afterward as well. I, I'm actually drawn to pink. And I remember one of my very, my very first solo show, uh, the gallery owner at the time said was horrified because the I actually made up promo cards and it was a very pink flower that was on the promo card. And she was horrified. She said, oh, pink doesn't sell. Why are you painting pink and why are you using that as the promotion? And I was like, I just loved it. The, the ironic part about it was that is that that was that was one of the first pieces it sold. So if I'm going to give advice to people is I really think it's important to follow your heart and what you are drawn to, you know, during the 30 years when I was raising my children and teaching, I really didn't have much of an opportunity to uh, um, engage in art directly for myself, but it's important to keep that alive uh, in you and be, you know, like keep exploring um, and, you know, to keep um, 
some kind of artistic practice going for yourself, it's not too late to start. Even, even when you're older, I mean, I'm living proof. And I would actually say, you know, like, if this is something you've always had a yearning for to, you know, when you finally have the time and you will finally have time at some point in your life. And then, yeah, so don't give up. And um, to know that all of the experience that you bring in your life is what is going to come through in the work that you ultimately create. So nothing is lost. I think that's the message that I want to leave people with, um, you know, just trust that at some point you're going to have an opportunity and Opus will be there. <laughs> I'd like to thank Sandy for joining us today and sharing her inspiring story. It really is never too late to start. A late bloomer can flower just as bright, if not even brighter. On that note, let's get making embrace the joy of colour and explore the many ways in which it can enrich our lives and enhance our creative practices. Thanks for watching.